but it's really windy. Which path should you take? <laughs> right? And the answer is that depends on how you, sp how you decide to prioritize robustness, how you s which, which of the metrics you put on robustness, it'll determine, you know, it'll depend on the exact width and the, the variance of the noise, for instance. Okay, but we wanna somehow be able to quantify that decision-making process. How do we decide to go left or right? You know, how do we, how do we embrace uncertainty or not? I th <laughs> a lot of my examples today have to do with wind. You know, it's been like ridiculously windy outside, right? I mean, I, I've been like I'm a punching bag uh, for the, you know, these 30 mile an hour gusts of wind on my commute, so I'm, I got wind on the brain. I, I, I think everybody who lives in Cambridge does. Okay, so <clears throat> at a high level, how do we think about, um, you know, how, do, how should we quantify performance? Of a stochastic system, right? Let me give you the map, actually, you know what? Let me write it over here so it can stay up, so you can kind of think back to what we're doing. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> one of the most popular choices, certainly it dominates what people are doing in reinforcement learning these days, there's good reasons for it, but one of the um, dominant choices is to say, instead of, um, you know, if, I, if, I've, if I've got x is now a random variable and I've got some cost function, then taking the expected cost, the expected value that I expect, given, you know, given I run a, a bunch of simulations, for instance, what is the average value of cost that I expect to incur? That's a very natural way to, to talk about performance in these kind of systems. It's not the only way though, okay? <clears throat> At the other extreme maybe, you'll find a lot of worst case analysis, which again, that even that comes in many forms, okay? <clears throat> but for instance, one form of that would be to say, I wanna prove that I will not um, violate any constraints or let's say not collide with any obstacles would be an example. But I want to prove with probability one, even if there's wind or if there's um, some sort of uncertainty in my model, I still want to give an absolute guarantee that I will not collide. And then there's a lot of things that I would say are sort of in between these. And this is going to be our, our roadmap here. And <clears throat> Uh, a softer version of this might be to say you have chance constraints. For instance, the probability of constraint violation is less than or equal to some alpha, for instance. You might say that my, you know, if, if there's a big obstacle in the middle of my Van der Poel oscillator, that there's some, you know, only a, uh, no more than 0.05% chance that I'll, I'll, one of those particles is gonna smack into the, the obstacle. But there are more still, okay. <clears throat> I think another important one that I wanna give you a nice examples for today is uh, gain bounds. which are, um, we'll, we'll see some examples, but roughly you could say, I'm not gonna promise, you know, if, if the disturbance that you could potentially put into my system is arbitrary, how can I make an arbitrary guarantee? What I'd, instead I wanna say is the, the, dis, the distribution of my system away from the nominal should be proportional to the distribution of the noise that you pump in. If you put in small noise, then I'll give, a, I'll give a good, tight 
trajectory tracking, for instance, output. But if you put in big noise, that I would be proportionally worse. And instead of having an absolute bound, saying I, nothing, like no collision will ever happen, you can, you can talk about relative bounds using uh, input-output gains. And I'm going to tell that story carefully. Okay, and the key idea there is that I'll land, to hopefully land today, is dissipation inequalities. There's more. These days people are talking about using the language of regret. I can go on and on. There's, uh, you know, actually there's, that's a pretty good list of, you know, there's, there are more things. There's conditional value at risk. There's other risk metrics, for instance, that come in. But <clears throat> this is a pretty good roadmap. Regret bounds. Um, yeah, we'll say, I'll say a few words about each of these uh, in some detail right now. But that's kind of our, our uh, not quite roadmap, but somehow that's so that when we're thinking about a particular idea and there's a derivation going on, we don't get lost in the shuffle of there's you know, a few big ideas there. We'll think about how they fit. Okay, let's, I think we have to start by saying a few words about um, why expected cost is so dominant. Why it's such a thing, uh, you know, something that so many of the derivations use. And maybe a word or two about um, how to use it and, and maybe its limits. Okay, so uh, the expected cost. So our deterministic versions of our optimal control problems have been, we're trying to minimize some average additive cost, right? This, this assumption of additive cost came from the dynamic programming world. We exploited that additive structure of the cost in order to make recursive algorithms for dynamic programming. And the optimal control, by and large, stays in the realm of these additive cost functions. You know, the expected cost, now if x is a, is a random variable, then <clears throat> we're going to change this to taking the expected value these are going to be over my w's, because that's the only randomness I put into the system, unless possibly I have a um, distribution over initial conditions. So what does that mean? So how could I, I could think about evaluating this in closed form sometimes, but you could also uh, think about evaluating this by just running a bunch of simulations where you draw the initial conditions <coughs> out of some, um, out of your uh, probability distribution and you draw your noise out of the probability distribution and you can approximate this by just running, you know, averaging, I already used n so let me use m here, um, Imagine evaluating that just by running a bunch of random simulations and averaging them. Okay, this would be called a Monte Carlo approximation. So that's kind of what it means. Uh, you know, at the, at the high level. But that's not the reason it's so popular. The reason it's so popular <coughs> is because the, uh, the additive structure of the expected value here allows me to exchange these operations and say, 
This is equivalent to, I can move this inside. And moreover, my dynamic programming recursion reduces, you can also move it inside this dynamic programming recursion let me say j x of at time n I normally used it like that j x of n plus j n plus 1 f of x u w Okay, so the additive cost of dynamic programming and the expected value work magically well together so that my Bellman equation simplifies to a one-step expectation, okay, and I get, the, I get that same recursive form, even though I'm now working with probabilities. That doesn't mean that these expectations are simple. Right, because the random variable x can be arbitrarily rich. If I pipe even a, a simple Gaussian um, into a nonlinear function, x can be very, very rich distributions. So that expected value can be complicated to compute and can be certainly capture very rich things. For instance, in my airplane example, right? I'm sorry, I just erased it. Um, let me sketch it again here. Okay, so if I have some um, narrow distribution because it's not very windy on this side, okay, and I have some wider distribution, maybe much wider, I'll make it excessive here. If I think of a cost function that is, I obtain cost when I'm inside the obstacle and no cost when I'm outside the obstacle, right? Then this expected value can actually capture the probability of being, you know, if I take the expected value by summing over the, all of the trajectories that enter the obstacle or not, then that expected value does have some ability to tell me a preference of, you know, depending on how big this variance is and how much that overlap is and how much that cost is, this expected value can help me make that decision. Right? Because the computation there is potentially very subtle and or, you know, very rich because this distribution can be arbitrary when you shove it through the dynamics and then you have to compute the cost along that expected value. Right? The expected value of this is an integral over all x of L of x, let's say pi of x, if I have a, a policy, times the probability over x. So the fact that I have this rich probability distribution means that even my simple loss functions can get very, um, you know, this can lead to, to interesting dynamics and interesting decision making. Since I've done this far, let me, let me show you now then. So, of course, there's going to be a, an example or two where we can work this out beautifully, okay? Uh, you can imagine LQR is one of them, right? I tend to do fall back to LQR a bunch, I know. One trick pony. What would it mean to do stochastic LQR?
you might, you might call it H2 synthesis. <coughs> um, I'll write what it is and then be clear about what it's not. be mean zero, so the expected value of Wn equals zero, and then it's, it's a Gaussian IID, which means that in our expected value notation here, Wi times Wj that can be a, um, an outer product in general. So. What does this mean? <clears throat> um, I'll even make it sigma i just to make the. Okay, so this says the mean is zero. Expected value of that number, at any draw of that, the expected value is zero. If you talk about the covariance between two um, draws, the delta ij is the, is the Dirac function when this is one if i equals j, zero otherwise. Okay, so we're saying that the um, covariance of this is, uh, is zero unless i equals j and then it's sigma. sigma squared. Okay, so it's a simple addition to what um, we've done before. Even before class, we were talking a little bit about LQG. You know, this is not quite LQG. There's also this, you know, famous linear quadratic Gaussian. LQG uh, problem has two parts. It has the stochastic LQR part, but it also has an observation with, observa with measurement noise. So LQG is, is bigger than this problem. It talks about doing state estimation and doing control. And I'm only thinking about we have full state, estim full state observations and we're just trying to do control, but the system's got process noise. Okay, so stochastic LQR H2 is a little bit smaller in this case than, than the full LQG. So my cost function here, L of XU, of course, is going to be um, X transpose QX plus U transpose RU. Now what's going to happen? I want you to, before we do any, I mean, the derivation is, I won't do in its full glory because it's so similar to the previous one, but we built up your intuition last time. What is the cost to go of this system going to do? Okay. I said you could think about a linear system as living on a quadratic potential. So if this system, if we're doing well, and this system, we get a stabilizing controller, stabilizing controller, we have to be careful about that, right? Then we'd expect, you know, to have a distribution where the stability of my controller and the noise come into balance and I have some sort of stationary distribution, right? So it looks like this. Now if I take the infinite horizon cost of that cost function, what happens? What's the infinite horizon cost of, this, of, a, of the optimal cost of the optimal controller on basically every stochastic LQR problem? If I'm going to sum from n equals zero to infinity of 
L of x u. Yeah, it goes off to infinity, right? Because you get zero cost when you're exactly at the origin. But even the best controller can't stay at the origin. We're constantly going to accrue. The, the reason that the Riccati equation had this nice solution before was because we, and we, our cost could be bounded even though it was infinite horizon, was because we required that the system actually get to the origin so that the cost stopped accruing. Right? But in the stochastic version of this problem, the cost does not stop accruing. Okay. So, I mean, this is a real thing, right? In, in reinforcement learning or um, you know, in a lot of dynamic programming, people will actually adjust these cost functions to be, for instance, a discounted cost. Or they'll take an average cost, maybe a limit as n goes to infinity. And there's various justifications for that in the literature, but you kind of, this I think often is papering over, is covering up this just basic phenomenon that. Costs, if written with stochastic dynamics, you know, even the LQR cost does not go to zero. It will accrue cost forever. And unless you somehow taper your cost or average over your cost or something, then you can have unbounded cost. But that cost still has a beautiful form. Okay, this is the big result from stochastic LQR. My claim, which we will verify here, which is all I have to do for optimal control, right, is I'm going to claim that my j at time n of x takes the form, my optimal cost to go, takes the form x transpose sx plus c of n. I'm going to do it in its, uh, in its potentially um, time varying form first. Okay, so it's going to have a quadratic form here, but it's going to have an extra constant term. And this quadratic form, the claim is that this quadratic form is actually the same as we got from LQR if there was no noise. It's a big time result. But there's an extra term which we can like put off to the side, watch it grow. This will grow to infinity. Okay, but all of the stuff that's growing to infinity can be put over here, and actually the, my main LQR result is still intact. It's a beautiful outcome of stochastic LQR. I'll just um, I'll do just the, the brief version of that. Okay, so we have our um, our stochastic Bellman equation, but if I write the Bellman equation for this, j of n on one side, drop the, the n's because I can do this for all x. This should equal the min over u, the expected value of my loss, which is x transpose qx plus u transpose ru plus jn at the next step. This thing 
is just um, turns out, okay, let's take the expected value over W of this. <clears throat> the only terms that depend on W are down here. So there's a bunch of stuff that doesn't depend on W plus the expected value over W. I'll write the, the few terms here. So there's AX plus BU Sn plus 1 times W. There's an expected value of the opposite of that, W transpose Sn plus 1 Ax plus Bu. Okay, and then there's the expected value W. Now this thing, again, by the linearity of the expected value, since the expected value of w is 0, or you could also say that since my current x and my current w are uncorrelated, this guy actually is 0 in expectation. And this thing is 0 in expectation. So my Riccati equation reduces to the min over u, x transpose qx plus u transpose ru plus x transpose, you know, plus my standard deterministic stuff for just deterministic LQR. The only terms that remain here are this. This is all standard LQR. And this last term gives me the equation CN equals, um, it gives me yeah, CN equals CN plus one plus the expected value of that. Okay, so the big time result says that even though what we said is absolutely true, and I hope your intuition is with me on that, that I can't stay at the zero point, I'm gonna constantly accrue cost, my cost to go goes to infinity, it turns out my cost to go goes to infinity in a super specific way. It actually converges to the cost to go of the discrete of the deterministic problem. And then it just has a constant that grows and grows and grows off to infinity. What does that mean in practice? It means, well, don't, you know, ask your R algorithm. Or, RL algorithm to compute the cost to go on something that should go off to infinity. That will fail. You have to discount it, okay? You should understand the cost to go is unbounded. But the optimal controller, you can just ignore the noise, solve the, dis the deterministic LQR, and that will give you the correct control gains, K, for this problem. Cool, uh, pretty cool result. Although <clears throat> people lean on it a little bit too heavily, I think, because it doesn't work for nonlinear systems. It, 
it is not the case that you can separate estimation and control in general, but people do. All right, so I'm, let me give you an example. Again, inspired by the wind. I'll even show you the motivation that we had back in the day, okay? So um, remember the perching stuff I was showing you before? Well, of course we started asking, can you perch outside, right? That's a, you can't just only do it in motion capture. That was elaborate because we had to figure out how to find the perch outside. Turns out the cool idea that Joe had was um, we should land on power lines. Partly, actually, the Air Force wanted to land on power lines. They wanted to like recharge their UAVs, and they maybe wanted to, I don't know, cut the bad guys' power lines, or like, which was a problem because um, in the places they wanted to go, there was like laundry and shoelaces, shoes on the on the power lines. But anyway, so let's let's say you wanted to land outside on a power line, and computer vision was hard back then. Um, it's probably still hard to find a power line with computer vision. So Joe had this idea that what if you put a magnetometer on your on your aircraft and then use the known potential field. It's actually, you know, the power lines tend to go in pairs, right? So it's a, um, a particular bipole, uh, you know, magnetic field. You can roughly estimate the, the current in these, these lines and you can, you can write a small estimation problem to find the perch just by, the, by moving a magnetometer through space. You can figure out where the power line is. Okay, so that's good. So we can figure out where the power line is, and we made this little mock power line you'll see in a second. But there's another problem, which is that there's wind outside, and we didn't put a propeller on the airplane. Remember, we the whole, we're like, oh, this is cool. We can do it with a glider. So this is how that went, okay? This is right outside on the lawn up in the Stata Center. You probably recognize it. Um, it actually worked incredibly well most of the time. <laughs> Every once in a while, the wind would come, and it just, like, that poor little plane had no chance. You know, you, we didn't even give it a propeller, right? So here's another one. This is actually pretty funny. Okay, so that one went over, and then you hear them kind of grumbling, like, what just... That plane never flew again. Um, <laughs> so I don't know what it hit, but it's like a, whoosh, you know, dishes cracked and kind of. Um, okay, so that begot, began our study of actually, what does the wind look like around Stata, <laughs> right? And we bought this like awesome ultrasonic anemometer. You know, it looks like something from Honey I Shrunk the Kids or something, right? But it's just measuring uh, the velocity of the air. We put it outside, collected some statistics. Of the, of the wind flow and tried to build a basic model of the wind, okay? Um, <clears throat> and there's good models out there. I've recommended to some of you. you know, the, the, there's the Dryden model, for instance. There's the uh, von Karman model are the two big, most dominant airflow models. But we actually tried to fit to data the basic Dryden model and even a, even a simpler uh, ARX kind of model to this data and, and fit it pretty well. Um, it's interesting, a lot of the wind models talk about the way the wind varies over space. But our fling was flying like three meters. Um, so we were worried about its time evolution much more than its spatial evolution. Okay, so, um, but the thing that you find out here if you look at these models is that the wind is definitely not IID Gaussian random noise, right? So we have this beautiful result for stochastic LQR saying that if you have a linear system or linearized system and you have a stochastic you know, IID Gaussian noise, then we can use LQR. But here we didn't have that luxury. So there's a key idea that makes this kind of work, and it's a, it's a, it's a nice idea. Okay. The idea is a whitening filter. The, if you look at the Dryden models or the von Karman models, they actually look, I'd be perfectly happy to have them implemented in Drake, for instance. <laughs> That's a stupid thing to say. Um, I'd be perfectly, they all take a random Gaussian IID type input, and then they put it through a wind model. 
some, some wind model that has state, you know. Okay. And that is going to give me the WN that I need to put into my UAV model. So <clears throat> you could think of this as a, um, a coloring filter, right? This would, if this was a linear system, one way you could model colored noise, the, right, I guess the, the way you model colored noise would be to take a Gaussian white noise and put it through like a low pass filter, right? Or some sort of notch filter, you can get different kind of colored, colored noise. And that's roughly what these wind models look like. Random noise input through a filter that gives me colored noise distributions of wind output. Now the problem I said was that this system does not have Gaussian IID input. But this system does have Gaussian IID input. So we can't run control LQR on this and expect success. But if we can run LQR on this, then we can, have, we can expect that to work. Okay, so, um, you know, stochastic LQR on the wind plus UAV model. It gives you U equals negative, in the stationary case, it gives you U equals negative K of X, right, in general. But this X now is the X from the wind plus the X from the UAV. Okay, so we've built, you know, a series of these models. This is like, you know, quad rotor getting buffeted by, uh, by the wind, getting stabilized by LQR. We'll talk about how to analyze that system in a minute. But actually, LQR can do a pretty good job. This was actually the LQR not understanding anything about the wind. But if you do it, this was a slightly different model, but if you allow the, if you design LQR of the, the joint system, then you can actually stabilize. It's a, a hard, to visualize, hard to see visualization, but the wind's moving around. This thing's staying pretty much rock steady at the fixed point. The difference is the controller has to observe the state of the wind. So you end up writing a small estimator for this linear system which is looking at the wind as it comes in and estimating what's my current state of the wind. Where am I in the, in the spectrum of the, of the wind here, right? And, you know, in the time evolution of the wind. And I write a controller with respect to that, okay? So actually LQR can do pretty beautiful things um, with stochastic models. Yes? This assumes that you know the, the, the internal state of the wind, the full internal state of the wind. Yeah. And um, that seems, I mean, if you're willing to accept your linear model of the wind, then estimating that state is a pretty standard op, uh, you know, observer kind of problem. It can encourage delay and all these, all these other features of state estimation that we haven't talked about in this class, but I don't think it's crazy especially if you have an ultrasonic anemometer right next to your perch. A little harder when you're flying, but. Okay, so <clears throat> maybe I, I sort of, that's the expected value version, the expected cost thing. And I, I don't, you know, I don't wanna give the impression that LQR solves everything, right? Um, it certainly doesn't. Famously, um, there's this great paper by John Doyle Right, where he says, you know, what are the margins for, let's say, LQR? Like, are there any guarantees you can get, in a robustness sense, for LQR, LQG type controllers? And he wrote this in the transactions. He's got this beautiful thing with this, maybe the shortest abstract, certainly I've ever seen, of three words. And actually, the the story goes that he originally submitted the paper with an abstract that just said no or something like this, like just one word, 
and the editors are like, we can't accept a paper with just one word abstract. So he's resubmitted like this, and they're like, fine. <laughs> okay. But but although it works well in expected in minimizing the expected cost, minimizing the expected cost does not give you guarantees that, for instance, you will not fail. Right. That's the, the lesson, but there's a, a, a specific deep lesson there, but that's the high level lesson I want you to get. So let's think about some of these other um, types of analysis, okay? So <clears throat> worst case analysis. There's a lot of good ideas in worst case analysis. I want to kind of lump them into, into a few big categories. So <clears throat> What would a, an argument based on worst case analysis go? So again, I'm starting with my x of n plus 1 Now typically, in the worst case analysis, this is going to require wn to be drawn from some bounded set. You can imagine cases where that's not absolutely required, but I'm going to say this is some bounded set of possible disturbances. And at a high level, if your loss function looks like that, the worst case analysis or worst case design will try to minimize some decisions u subject to the worst possible adversary. Okay, So where uh, an, an omniscient opponent was allowed to pick w on every time in order to defeat me in, in their, in their, as well as they possibly could. A minimax game. Moreover, they get to pick W that's a function of my of my current state. So they get to have all the information. At every play, at every mo moment, they get to pick uh, what's the worst possible W to, to give me. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> this path in robust control can give you strict guarantees if you can find such a U, right? It's designed to give you absolute guarantees. No matter what happens in W, I can still achieve my goal. We've already seen at least one example of this. Remember when we did common Lyapunov functions? Right, we said, for instance, the mass of my quadrotor or my A matrix in my controller was only known up to some limits. It, was, it lived inside some polytope. But for all possible A's, I could still prove that V dot was less than 0. So I could guarantee that my, my, cost, my, my task was going to succeed, even though there was you know, no matter which model was the true model. So commonly Lyapunov functions, for instance, are one way to certify uh, stability in that case. Or you can give a, if you can do a, um, a cost version of that, you can try to certify guaranteed cost. But there's a lot, of, a lot of you are playing with things like, not a lot of you, a few of you are playing with things like um, tube MPC, right, for instance. 
There's a particular shape of, of worst case analysis that shows up often in robotics and control which is where the, the, the worst case you want to avoid is a constraint violation. So the most visual version of that is my um, you know, obstacle avoidance, for instance. So um, a lot of the arguments in worst case design do run through this idea of uh, some sort of Lyapunov function or reachability analysis. So you might say that if I know where my airplane is now, then um, no matter what the adversary picks, I know that in one step I'll be in this region, and then on another step I'll be in this region, Right, and another step will be in this region. I play, they, they play, right? And if you can find a set of regions which you're guaranteed, for instance, by a Lyapunov-like argument to stay inside that do not intersect with the obstacles, then you could absolutely certify success, okay? So these compu computations are uh, stochastic, but, but a you know, worst case reachability problem. And um, they're very tied to the ideas of Lyapunov functions or barrier functions. Right, right. Good question. So the question is, like, why doesn't it just grow constantly without bound? Remember, there's two competing forces, right? You have the stability of your controller that gets to pull in, and you have the adversary that's trying to push you out, okay? So this, the only way you get a finite reachability tube is if those things are able to balance. If your, your, your response is able to countermand the, the argument from the, you know, the, the adversary. Which is what we, if we have a Lyapunov argument, we've done that, right? And we do. There's, there's lots of, um, you know, lots of practical systems that we use these tools for. Okay. So there's a large literature, and I think um, Tube MPC is, is one of those where the tube, these are the tubes here, okay? They, the tube MPC often uses particular representations for that, a particular class of algorithms, but a tube version of model predictive control where you're trying to put forward some reachable computation and uh, you know, plan on the fly those tubes so that you don't run into the obstacles. But I wanna actually move, I, yeah, there's a lot more to say about that, but I'm gonna choose um, my favorite one to make sure I land today here. Because I think it's, <clears throat> it's important maybe and um, not a fully appreciated, but let's talk a little bit about the gain bounds story, okay? So if I have a system here with u coming in, w coming in, let's say to start that I have x 
inside. The argument I told you is this. This is a relative. I could do kind of a worst case analysis, but relative to the magnitude of w. Now, we'll have to define that carefully. So the type of argument I might like to have is something to the effect of, um, I'll take my total deviation in x. Okay, let's say my goal is to get to x equals zero, and I'll say that my um, my ability to achieve that was somehow measured by um, the square root of that. And I can't bound this because I'm not willing to put a, a, you know, a reasonable bound on w. Let's say that x of n, if, if w is big, really x of n is going to get very big, this, these, these terms. I'm not willing to put an absolute bound on this. Maybe it's more reasonable to put in a relative bound. That looks more like that. Okay, and <clears throat> because I don't know w, w is allowed to be chosen from um, from an adversary. I'm going to be taking the the worst case of this. So I'll, I'll take the worst case over possible w's of this bound, and this would just be chosen from all w's that have uh, finite. I just want this term to be um, bounded. Okay, so that would be like a input to state gain bound. It turns out there's a more useful generalization of that, which doesn't add much complexity and gives us a lot more modeling power, which maybe I have y coming out here, but let me add a new z coming out, a second output. You can call that your performance output, if you like. You'll see these diagrams a lot in robust control. I'm only doing a light touch on this, OK? We still have x kicking around inside, but z is now some function of potentially x and u, right? just like y is. OK? So you can do exactly the same thing. You could talk about the the gain bound over w in this class of the magnitude of z over the magnitude okay that, that's just the gain and if i have if i'm able to make an argument that this thing is less than for instance sigma squared then this could be my uh, this would be an L2 gain bound. It's an input-output bound. And when these signals are in L2, it's an L2 gain bound, okay? Now, this is strictly more general than this because I can just choose Z to be X, okay? But this idea of having an input-output bound um, allows a, a bunch of interesting things. Like, for instance, if I choose z of n to be square root of qx, square root of r u, a vector signal that's like this, then this term on the top is actually just the LQR cost. So that's a way to write even the LQR objective relative to my noise in, in this input-output form. Yo, sorry, yes? What is the vector Z function? 
uh, supremum, it's just like max. It's a, it's a, but w is a continuous variable, so it's just it's, it's a generalization of, of the maximum okay, of a continuous variable. Um, thank you for asking that. Okay, so so it's just it's cool that we can put like a, a cost an optimal control thing in this form. There's another super important advantage of writing this input output version of the gain bounds. And that's an idea called the small gain theorem. Okay. Roughly, if you have gain bounds on individual systems, you can compose them together in a diagram to get gain bounds on your whole system. Or to talk about absolute stability. Yes? It's a good question. I'm going to repeat it. So, so could I put an expected value up there? The philosophy here, this is part of my stubbornness, that to say that only randomness comes in through W. Okay, so there is no, um, you know, Z is a function of, of W in this case. So, so as a function of w, conditioned on W, if you will, Z is deterministic. And I really want that to be not an expected value there. I won't do the small gain theorem full justice here, but I want to at least show you the value of these gain bounds, okay? You can imagine if I have a gain, if I'm able to achieve an input output bound here, that's for instance less than one, and an input bound, input output bound here, that's less than equal to one, then I can talk about the total system being stable. Having a total spec, you know, having being bounded by a something that has a eigenvalue less than one, roughly. Okay, that this this whole loop can compose um, subsystem gain bounds to infer properties of the diagram. Now, I want to convince you that you almost already have the tools to figure out gain bounds, if you so choose. A small extension of Lyapunov theory shows us how to do it, how to, how to prove stability, even for a nonlinear system. And a small extension of LQR can actually give you the best control to take in, in, the, in the response of trying to push down a gain bound. Okay. Okay. So we're going to get gain bounds via Dissipation inequalities. This is a small generalization, but important, of the Apanov functions. especially for input-output stability, or for input-output analysis. That's what we're using here for. <clears throat> How does that work? If 
I want to make if I want to make an argument about an input to output gain bound, okay, let's say from W to Z of some system, the deterministic Lyapunov function says that I want V dot to be less than or equal to zero, right? Or maybe even less than zero, depending which one we're asking for. A dissipation inequality says that V dot is less than some supply rate. So that's, I'm, gonna, I'm arguing that that's going to give us extra modeling power here. We consider Lyapunov functions that don't have to go downhill always. They might go up, they might go down, but the way that they go up or down, if they're going to go up, it's a function of x and w. So you can imagine if my, um, right, if my system is not going to always converge, but it could get worse if there, someone puts more noise into the system. I might have to go up in my value-like function, value -like function. But as long as I say that the amount you go up is proportional in some way to the rate that I'm putting noise into the system, then I can still make some sophisticated arguments. The key observation here is that if I were to integrate both sides of these equations, then I can make statements of the form v of x t final minus v of x at 0 is going to be less than or equal to the integral of that supply rate, OK? 0 t. And that turns out to be exactly what we, one of the ways you can, you can provide an L2 gain bound. Here's how. My supply rate, you're not surprised, you shouldn't be surprised that it, you know, we're allowing it to go uphill a little bit if proportional to the size of W. Okay, but it turns out we're also going to let it go, make it go down fast in, with respect to, to Z. And a little bit of algebra allows us to turn this around <coughs> to say then that V of XT minus V of X. 0 is less than the integral of this thing. I can go ahead and say that, for instance, that for um, so it's a, a couple arguments here. So I can say that v of 0 equals 0. That was a, that's a standard uh, assumption we could put on v. And um, since this must be true for all x, it certainly must be true for x equals 0. So we can get down to, let's see, v of x t. Less than or equal to that. We can get rid of this. And since v of xt 
greater than or equal to zero by our standard of the up and up type assumptions, we can actually still we can write this as zero is less than or equal to t gamma squared or I can flip this around and this implies that Gamma is our L2 gain, okay? So it suffices to find a Lyapunov function that goes downhill at this rate, right? It's proportional to, to gamma. You're not gonna be able to satisfy the Lyapunov conditions, you know, these, uh, that basic condition for all gammas. But if you pick a big enough gamma, you'll be able to satisfy it if, you, if there's an L2 gain for the system. Okay, and for whatever gamma, the, for the smallest gamma, for instance, that you can find, you would call that the L2 gain for the system. So it's actually beautiful connection between the Apunov theory and this sort of gain bounded robust control. And it turns out you can also do control design to try to minimize that gain. That's what H infinity control is. And I, there, so there's, um, again, actually, H infinity is very intimidating to, re to read about, especially, because, well, I think these days we don't, people aren't as familiar with frequency domain as they used to be, right? And almost all of the strong H infinity derivations are presented in frequency domain. It's just a barrier to entry. But there's an LQR kind of derivation that can show you very nicely. And I'll just, I'll just tell you what it looks like and, um, Hopefully that it'll connect to this. So if I choose um, to minimize my LQR-like gain, but also maximize, do my minimax gain, um, This is a small variation on LQR, but this is gonna, you know, this is gonna be rewarding. Um, so if I can keep this cost low, even when W is big, that's a good thing. I'm like rewarding behavior. This is, this, you know, helps the adversary only. Okay, but, but otherwise it's a pretty small change to LQR. And in fact, the math goes through. So if you could take, you can take the gradient with respect to W, you get the optimal play for the adversary. You could take the gradient with respect to U, you get the optimal play for the agent. That all still works. But what's amazing is that you remember that we have that, um, you know, this, the basic property of the, of the Bellman equation is that
right? That was our big thing comparing Lyapunov and cost to go functions, right? Was that we want to go downhill at the rate of the negative cost. This is exactly v dot less than gamma squared w squared minus uh, I wrote that badly. It's it's this, which is the same as the you know if I took z to be square root of q x square root of r u, it's z squared. So the Riccati equation solution for this, if I can find it, gives me, allows me to read out a gain bound gamma. The derivation is more than I'll write in the last minutes, but it's simple. It's the same kind of derivation, same, par same partial you know, that we did before. The Riccati equation is almost the same. But you'll remember that before we said the Riccati equation had a solution, a positive definite solution, if the system was stabilizable. Now, it doesn't always have a, a, a solution. It has a solution when gamma is big enough. So you actually have to search for gamma. You, try, you could try a gamma. If you get no solution to your Riccati equation, then you know that the system can't be stabilized with that gain bound. But if you increase gamma, if you can find, once you find one, all bigger gammas will also work. It's monotonic in gamma, okay? <clears throat> if you can find a gamma for which the Riccati equation has a solution, then you can, it gives you an optimal controller. It also gives you the optimal play for the adversary, and it gives you this L2 gain bound. So if you do a little line search to find the smallest gamma and take the controller, then you found the, the best K to minimize the L2 gain. All right, so let me just like step back for a second here. So big picture, there's a lot of big ideas in robust control. Maybe I'll spend some time on the, uh, on the other, the ones I didn't get to the next time, okay? Average cost, super popular, very valuable. It does capture some of the tails of the distribution and the like, okay? but it doesn't give you the ability to make guarantees. You could argue whether you need guarantees or not. There's a, there's a powerful set of worst case analysis tools like TubeMPC that allow you to prove things about no collisions. They tend to be a little conservative, right? Sometimes you pay a price, you can, you, you know, getting that proof means you've either sacrificed performance or you can't prove things in the hard situation. And then we talked a, the most about gain bounds, which is a way to sort of soften that worst case analysis, instead of saying there doesn't exist, you know, for any W, I won't collide with the tree. This one says my performance is scaled with the magnitude of the W you put in, okay? And this gives us like this great idea, you know, this, this ex with a simple extension of, of Lyapunov theory, we can derive gain bounds and we can de derive, you know, controllers that try to achieve minimum gain bounds. Okay? Regret I didn't get to. Chance constraints I didn't get to, but they're good to have on your list. Yeah? Okay, cool.